Hey everyone, welcome back to Design, Create, Inspire with me, Bryn Young. Today I want to talk to you about being a mother in architecture. Now it's very fitting because when I was setting up my schedule for my shows, I didn't plan on yesterday being International Women's Day, so it's uh, just perfect. It fits in very well. Um, there's not the most female architects as role models in history, and uh, that's one of the things I'm going to kind of discuss. Um, so being a female architect, and um, especially during a Women's International or International Women's Day, I really like to try to find some of those past inspiring women who have you know, got me to where I am today only through seeing what they did and being inspired by them. So I thought perfect timing for me to hopefully give you some information on my experience and hopefully inspire any young women or young women who want to be a mother or are mothers um, that you can still be an architect and a mother. Now, this is also fitting and why I wanted to do this because... I am currently six months pregnant. <laughs> so this is something I don't really advertise. Um, and I'll go into a little bit about that as well. Kind of this weird dichotomy of being a professional while also having a big belly and how to um, kind of handle that and what I've been faced with versus what are kind of my own limiting beliefs or my own gender biases. So these are things that I want to kind of briefly go over today. So to start off, I want to talk about a little bit about the gender information in the architecture world. There's some really great articles that I'm going to link and I recommend going there because there are charts and stats and way more information than I can give you here, but just really, really briefly, um, because I remember going into, well, here, let me back up a little bit. First off, growing up, I loved architecture. I loved design of all things. Generally, I loved residential design. Growing up, I was told I would be a great interior designer. And so that is what I, just new as an, a possibility and an option and what I what I strive to be. I never really heard much about architecture. My great grandfather was an architect and so I knew what an architect kind of was, but I didn't really think of it as even like a thing. <laughs> I also wasn't a big school person, um, especially like in my younger years, I wasn't a big school person. so. To me, the idea of being something like an engineer or a doctor, you know, architecture usually was on that kind of caliber and I was, it just was intimidating. So to me, interior design was the natural path. Um, it wasn't until I started interior design that I realized architecture was really, really where my heart was. And I wish that I had had some female role models when I was younger who were architects where I could see that that was where my passion was and um, kind of get involved in that world even earlier. So I hope, I think things are probably changing, but um, so <clears throat> when I went to architecture school a couple years later, there were quite a few women in my classes. I would say probably half the students were women. And I loved seeing this. We even had female uh, professors and it was really wonderful to see because I felt at that time that it was, it felt pretty equal. Uh, some of the strongest students were women as well. So there's this really great project. It started out as a survey through the AIA San Francisco. So this project was originally called the Missing 32%. It was a survey done in a study about equality. Now this committee has changed names uh, since this was a while ago, and now it's called um, Equity by Design. So they basically study 
gender and um, what that what's happening in the world of architecture. So what they found, and and again, I'm going to link the all the research or the article. Architect Magazine had a great article about it. They include tons of um, graphs and all this information. I again, I'm not going to give you all the specifics just because it's so much, but just an overlying general concept was that there were a lot of women in school and women were doing really well in architecture school and even starting their exams and they would start off in the profession as being in leadership roles and being some of the top people. They were really well driven. Now what happened was that started to fade off and as years of experience went on, we started to see a decline in women in leadership positions and even in um, licensing and sticking with the profession, essentially. Um, they call them these pinch points. And essentially, there's these points in your architecture career that kind of push people out. Um, and you'll see in graphs for men and women, there are certain things like you start off first couple of years, there's a lot of people in the profession. And then it starts dwindling. And there are a lot of things like getting licensed, um, pay and work, work quality, all these things that start filtering people out. Now there's this time in the women's experience. I think it was around 10 to 15 years, which usually if you think about it is around childbearing time um, or even like before that where they saw a larger group of women taking leaves of absences. Now, what they're seeing is that once these people are leaving, it's harder for them to get back in the industry. And I have a quote here I'm going to find. Um, this is the survey found the majority of women in architecture do take a leave of absence, most frequently around the childbearing and child rearing years, but that men do not. And that there's a big stigma for leaving architecture that once you leave, it's like falling out of the pearly gates of heaven. You can never get back in. So obviously, this is just a stigma. Once you leave, you 100% get back in. But it's this mentality around it. And it's this mentality that the woman leaves in order to take care of the children. You have... Say you have a husband architect and a woman architect. Well, the woman bears the child and then is expected to stay home. Or maybe even the woman herself feels like she's expected to stay home, even if her husband doesn't put that burden on her. It's this societal pressure that we have grown up in and um, felt. And I know that this specifically has related to me. Um, I've always been very... I'm going to work and I am going to build a business and I'm an entrepreneur, but I always wanted kids too. And it was this kind of hard conflict of, can I do both? Now in 2016, or let's see, 2017, NCARB came out with their demographics. And I looked, I just looked and they, it didn't look like they came out with more recent ones. So I think this is the latest one. If you do find they have more recent ones, Definitely send them my way because I love to see these. But they actually saw that licensure candidates and new architects are more diverse than ever, not only just with women, um, but also minority groups, which is really incredible to see. So in 2016, women accounted for 36% of newly licensed architects. Now, obviously, that's still less than men. Um, you know, it'd be lovely to see 50-50, but at least that's more. Um, if you look at some of the graphs and... Um, I'll post some of the graphs in, in my blog post too, but if you look at some of the graphs, you can see that there's a steady increase. Also with women, women complete their initial license on average 10 months quicker than men. And that was really kind of eye-opening to me. Then when I went back to that study, I saw that that is, has been pretty common, um, not that specific number, but just that women excel quicker than men in the industry. And what they kind of attribute it to is that women know that they're going to eventually have babies. Of course, not every woman, but you know, I'm speaking 
generally here, they're going to have um, children. So what they do is they try to work as hard as possible in the beginning while they can before they have kids so that they do get licensed. They do get up to these certain levels so that when they it is time to take off or or take a leave of absence, they're in a position to do so. Where there's that missing percent that they're talking about so much is the people that do all that hard work, but then don't come back. And it's that, you know, pearly gates, like they were saying, that it's hard to come back. And again, I don't know if that is because it is actually hard or because mentally it's hard or because you've been out of the game for a minute. So I want to read this. It's Sylvia Plath, which of course is like can be a little bit dark and down. But I read this quote years and years ago and I wrote it down because it really is meaningful to me in maybe not the way you would necessarily think, but I'll read it to you and then I'll explain afterwards. So this is from Sylvia Plath, the bell jar. And the quote is, I saw my life branching out before me like the green fig tree in the story from the tip of every branch, like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband and a happy home and children. And another fig was a famous poet. And another fig was a brilliant professor. And another fig was E.G., the amazing editor. And another fig was Europe and Africa and South America. And another fig was Constantine and Socrates and Attila and a pack of other lovers with queer names and offbeat professions. And another fig was an Olympic lady crew champion. And beyond and above these figs were many more figs I couldn't quite make out. I saw myself sitting in the crotch of this fig tree, starving to death, just because I couldn't make up my mind which of these figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest. And as I sat there, unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black, and one by one, they plopped to the ground at my feet. So. Obviously, Sylvia, she is a dark woman, but that's so profound to me because that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> and I, could, I think how I've always felt is that I do want a husband and a happy home and children. I wouldn't mind being a brilliant professor, um, which maybe I am trying to do. <laughs> um, I want to be an architect. I want to be an artist. I want to be a writer. I want to be all these things and with her she was saying that if she chose one she couldn't have any of the other ones like it was one or nothing and I think that often this is how we are presented things like if you choose to be a mother then you can't have the architecture if you choose to have the architecture you can't be a good mother or a mother at all because you're not going to have the mental capacity or anything to do it. And I have almost looked at this quote as inspiration to do it all. Like, you know what? I'm not going to sit and watch these inspirations wrinkle and die and do none of them. I'm going to do as many as possible while also trying to do them well. I don't want to be a jack of all trades, a master of none, but at the same time, I want to live my life as full as possible. And with that means hopefully not sacrificing certain things like being a great architect and being a great mother. So growing up, knowing that I was You know, I I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to be a businesswoman. I loved it. At the same time, I always did want to be a mom. And I always wanted to be, you know, have a great family. and, And that was also part of my path. It's interesting because the first time I got, I was pregnant. I was finishing my thesis. I was growing my business. So I was having business meetings 
and um, I was giving presentations. And the first time around, I don't know, I, it, I don't remember it feeling very funny. I kind of owned it, like walking through school being super pregnant, you know, it was my master's program. It's not like I was in high school, but you know, I, I, I didn't feel so weird about it for some reason this time around, and I'm getting a little vulnerable with you. Um, this time around, I've tried to hide it as much as possible and from clients. And I think it's this, you know, limiting belief that I have had just growing up that, oh, you know, pregnancies, you know, you're more weak or you can't do it. Or I'm worried that clients might think, oh, she's pregnant. I don't want to hire her because who knows where she's going to be in six months. Oh, once she has the baby, she's not going to come back to work. Blah, blah, blah. Of course, I know that's not the case because, I mean, I've had a kid and I was at work didn't even, you know, it wasn't affected at all. And I know that that's the case with this. And I'm passionate about architecture, just like I'm passionate about being a mom. So to me, I know it's not a big deal. It's more my fear of the perception other people have on it, which is this difficulty that I've been dealing with lately that like, well, husbands and men don't deal with that, like, or partners that aren't bearing the child, you know, a husband can have a wife who's eight months pregnant and he can go to meetings and he's not wearing it on himself. So he could get away with never telling them or he could tell them. And I don't think there would be any misconception or worry or anything about his you know, productivity or anything. And again, this could be my own limiting belief. And I would love to hear, like, comment and tell me, because <laughs> is this just me? Is this just in my own head? Because, you know, if you were a client, what would you think? Or um, are, if you're a woman or mother, have you ever been in this position? I know that I've talked to other women architects who say the same, like, how long did you go until you told your employer? Of course, it's different with me because I don't have to tell an employer. I can work however long and much as I want. It's more my clients that I want them to know I'm going to perform and be the best for them, pregnant or not. And I was recently getting ready for a client meeting. It was a hot day. I had clothes on to kind of try to cover. And at this point, if I do that, I just look big, you know, and it's like, you might as well just wear it and own it. And I was getting ready and I just felt so uncomfortable. And I thought, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to wear my, you know, a pregnancy shirt or whatever, you know, a tight shirt, show my six month belly, meet with these two older gentlemen and have this client meeting as the architect. And that's what I did. And no one commented on my belly, which good. Um, but it was a little scary. Like it was nervous going up to it. Like, oh gosh, I'm, you know, what are they going to think? Are they, who's this architect? Anyways, it ended up being fine. I haven't heard anything about it since. Um, I guess I'm saying all this because I want you to know that even I get nervous about these gender uh, roles and I myself put them on myself and I try not to and I try to own it like I'm you know the boss and I'm pregnant and I can do both and you know I will be able to have two kids and still be boss I've you know I, I've been doing this podcast for the last since I've been pregnant and Yes, I'm out of breath a lot, <laughs> but hopefully you guys haven't been able to tell. Um, but yeah, I think that this is just all things that you kind of go through as a mother in architecture, which I think a lot of men probably don't even think about, or it doesn't even cross their mind. So it's not even something that has to, you know, be 
thought about. Um, luckily, I love my profession. I don't think every mother needs to be a working mother. It's not for everybody. For me, I love this so much. This is also who I am. I don't just identify as a mother. I don't just identify as an architect. I don't want to be like Sylvia Plath. I want to be able to do a lot and do as much as I can while I'm here and able to do it. The other thing, I have one daughter and I'm pregnant with another daughter. And <clears throat> to me, I want to be a powerful inspiration to those girls and show them that you can be a mom and you can do whatever else you want to do. My daughter not long ago, I said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I think she said something with animals, like a zoo, you know, zookeeper or something like that. And then she goes, oh, well, you know, I want to be a mom. And I was like, you can do both. You can, you don't, you can be a zoo, zoologist and you can also be a mother. One does not mean you can't do the other. And I think that's such an important lesson if they can see, if they can see me do it hopefully successfully and still have a happy family, then hopefully they will be able to see that as an option as well. So my advice to other women out there who are either already mothers, who are thinking about wanting to be a mom, I say just do it. Just do either one, whether it's become a mom or go back into architecture, say you've taken a little hiatus, just do it. I think there's no pearly white gate. You can get back in the game. Um, watch some YouTube videos, see what, what's out there and, and how, you know, what's the latest software and own it. You know, we don't have to be put in a box. We can do it all. Um, just make sure you love what you do. And if you love it, then do it. And if you need to take time when you have a baby, take time. Don't think that because you're out of the industry that you can't get back in. You definitely can get back in. I think there's more of a equal understanding happening in architecture now that's making it easier to get back in. Um, hopefully more understanding for, for parents and for mothers. And, you know, some days you might want to quit. Some days are hard, for sure. <laughs> but um, if you love it, stick with it. And I had someone reach out to me recently who doesn't, she's not pregnant yet. She doesn't have any kids, but she's starting to study for the exams, for the architecture exams, and kind of said, like, what should I do? Should I put off having my baby and, and get through the exams first? Or should I have the baby and then take the exams later? And I don't think you have to make that choice. I think you do what, whatever's right. I think you can do them simultaneously. I took my first architecture exam when my daughter was eight months old. And I passed my last architecture exam when she was two years and eight months. So yeah, it maybe took a little bit longer, but I, I don't feel like one had to be on hold, especially with newborns. They freaking sleep all the time. Yeah, they're up like every two hours at night, but during the day they sleep a lot. You just strap them on you and then you can do all your work. And um, I just think that if you wait for one or the other, one or the other might never come. If I said I was gonna wait until all my exams passed until we had a family, First of all, that's a lot of pressure um, to finish your exams by a certain time. Also, maybe it will take you three years to finish your exams. If you say you're going to start your exams, you know, after you had a kid and you know, they've got, you know, gotten to a certain age, that's also a risk. Who knows how long it'll take you to get pregnant. And then also when it does, maybe it might feel overwhelming to get started. So I just think... Sometimes we put too much pressure on ourselves to make it a one or the other decision. And I think it's okay to meld them together and have them be both part of your life. And you can be successful in both without feeling like 
You can only be successful in one while sacrificing the other. So a couple other things I want to say too about being a mom and an entrepreneur or mom and an architect is for me, I really enjoy work. I love um, connecting with you guys through this, through teaching. Um, I love working with my clients. I love designing. So to me, it helped with my mental health while being a mother. It's like I need that, that little escape. Um, to be a full-time mom for myself is uh, not really practical and would be really, 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 really hard for me. Again, that's not everybody. So you may be in architecture and then have a kid and realize that is what you want to do all the time. For me, it's not. So so to me, um, it helped me have this with being a mother. It helped me have this sense of being an adult and being independent and um, having my own life and business and some normalcy. So to me, it really helped having this. Um, and, you know, I, I think either way, no matter what you do, as I've said multiple times, but it's just important to not put too much pressure on yourself and be flexible. Kids are, you know, it's wild. You never know what, what's going to happen. So you have to be flexible with it. Um, and, you know, you have to know that your feelings might change when you get pregnant or when you have a kid. And just knowing that it is all possible. And I promise you can do it all. If you are a mother or soon-to-be mother or prospective mother, know that there is space for all of us in this industry. And um, having a child shouldn't ever hold us back and that we can do it all. So I I hope that was helpful. I am definitely going to link all the the resources and the surveys because those are where you're going to find the meat of the information. I am not a scientist. I'm not a economist. I'm just kind of a person with a story. So uh, I, I want to share my story to inspire other people and other women to know that you're not alone. Um, there's space for us and we can do it all. So thank you so much for sticking around and being here with me today. And I will see you guys next week. Talk to you later. Bye.